roundup of trench two at the end of the season. Well, almost the end of the season because we're still chasing the natural here in the, the passageway around the palaestra of the baths. But essentially, we've got a lovely sequence of, of floors resurfacing and underneath those floors in the northward uh, north-south stretch of the passageway we've got a really nice deposit which dates clearly the second bathhouse pottery and then coins uh, which give us a date in the early second century for the construction of the second bathhouse somewhere sort of 100 and 125 we've got uh, datable Samian and we've got coins of, of Trajan so that's, that's really good. Um, it's a complicated story. Um, we've got evidence for flooding low down. We've got very nice um, silting, laminated silts, which accumulate on the earliest uh, floor of the first bathhouse. So one can perhaps understand why first bathhouse is demolished and replaced, because it was uh, fighting the water. Um, and that agrees with really what we found in our very first season in 2018 where again raising of levels to escape uh, the water. So that's that's essentially where we've got to in trench two. Objectives achieved were well, almost um, to getting right down to the <laughs> Kevin working right down to get to the, the geological subsoil. Well, here we are at trench, trench five, where we have um, re-exposed the, uh, the caldarium of the first bathhouse and the heated suite uh, related to the second bathhouse, which extended one more range further to the south. This excavation, this area, has been really important for teasing out the different plans of each bathhouse and then how they changed over time and perhaps one of the most significant developments here has been the recognition that in the second bathhouse the bathhouse ended with a rectangular um, um, a, a rectangular finish a rectangular um, detail largely robbed out but adding on to the width of the first bathhouse whose foundations in. you can see by the shadow of my hand. So that's, that's the western limit of the first bathhouse and the rectangular end to the second bathhouse. And the second bathhouse significantly modified, and we don't know when, but somewhere late second, early third century, by the conversion of the rectangular ends certainly here at the west end, to a nice upsidal finish. So a nice apse domed um, above, um, a recess for a pool perhaps, or a statuary or, or something like that. And as you look down the length of this section of the bathhouse, you're seeing the multiple stacks of pili which supported the floor. And in the life of bathhouse one, there were there was certainly a furnace at the far end, we'll go and look at that, and probably a supplementary furnace at this, the west end. But when the bathhouse was extended southwards, of course it was no longer possible to have a furnace along the south wall, but they retained, I think, the um, furnace and the heating at the east end. So we'll go down and see those, those elements. So now I'm at the east end of Trench 5. I'm looking down into part of the stoke hole, part of the, the, the furnace with walls flanking it that heated that first bathhouse and also the second bathhouse. And you can see here the foundations of this wall, the clear green sand blocks just to the west of me and a pair of cross walls giving sufficient mass to support a hot bath. So the furnace heating a tank of water to supply a shallow hot bath positioned here. And that I think essentially was retained 
in the life of the second bathhouse, while the rest, no longer having access to a furnace coming in on the south side, was um, a slightly cooler place. And then if we turn around, we can see something of the, uh, more clearly than at the west end, the additions which gave much greater volume to the second bathhouse. So, you see here these brick foundations extending out eastwards and onto the edge, if not over the edge, of what was the Iron Age um, inner earthwork ditch. But brick features of a shallow nature cut across this west end and may have provided some sort of terminal at some point in the life of Bath House 2. But in this corner over here, if we walk over here, you see the same brick structures, the beginning of a, again, a rectangular end to the southern range. So mirroring, if you like, what we can now see where Nick's been excavating at the west end. And then very clearly here, you see the way the apses are added later. So both in the south range and obviously here, not so well preserved as at the west end, you've got this um, later addition, as I say, probably the late second or early third century. But the story doesn't end there because, as you see, there are pili all over this east end and extending over the foundations of the Prifernium, of the, the furnace house running out um, and behind me. But down there in the front, you see a later, you see a later furnace structure which is now providing heat just for this east end. So you've got the remains very um, vitrified, the brick, the brick breaking up. You've got the remains of the two cheeks of the, of, of, of the furnace and the heat coming through. And conceivably, given the, the dimensions, still able to heat some kind of hot bath at this east end in the, well, again, we don't know the date of this, fourth century or later, and probably after we've lost completely the south range. They've done away after a, a life of perhaps 100, 150 years, they've done away with the south range. The bath has a shrunk back here, internal space being used to provide the heat for the west end. And it's now possible once more to have heat coming in from the south end. So the western end of this, where the, you see the peel ice sacks, could also be uh, heated as well. But right at the far end, we've got the makings of a wall that's coming across um, as if to block off the western apse. So in this latest period, and we just really don't know the date, um, that western apse is lost. You've got a source of heat to create a nice hot space here, but also, perhaps more crucially, even greater heat capacity and perhaps to continue the provision of a hot bath at the east end. So I'm standing on the, the deeply robbed out remains of this eastern extension that belongs to the second bathhouse this brick built structure uh, with the water now lapping over the, um, the remains. And this wall was reduced and robbed out in the very late fourth century and replaced with a slighter structure which was to enclose what we excavated it in our first season in 2018. This or this, this hypercourse system where you just see at the edge you see the, the masses of masonry and then the gaps the channels where the hot air circulated. But that wall which rested, which came through at this height, there's only a tiny stub of it remaining, that wall 
too was eventually robbed out, presumably in the Middle Ages. But this and the earlier robbing of the more massive period two war all happens right at the end of the Roman period. So we have pottery and we have some coins of the house of Theodosius really right at the end of the fourth century, uh, dating the period when you have this new feature created and the robbing out to make way for this, this new structure. So we've got lots of over all lots to, to, to say about, about the bathhouse from the, its very beginning, bathhouse one, time of Nero. We've really got a much clearer picture of bathhouse two and of its continuing life right to the end of the Roman period. And right at the end of the Roman period, they're still trying to keep that bathhouse going, the signs of buttressing for the walls, walls which presumably are subsiding into the soft underlying soil, particularly here on the eastern side. Right, um, it's just here. So I wanted to just show you this as an example of the lengths that the builders went to prepare uh, for the building of the bathhouse or the bathhouses. So here you can see to a depth which is going deeper than a metre, masses of packed, tight packed flint and, and clay and mortar laid down. Perhaps this was a particularly soft spot, but everywhere we've seen the foundations, we've seen either nodular flint from the chalk or uh, greensand uh, blocks from, from the weald used to create a, a solid a foundation as possible. But despite all that, it does seem as if water and subsidence, particularly on the eastern side where the ground was soft at the edge of the Iron Age, they were continually struggling to maintain the integrity and the fabric of the baths. It's really quite something to be standing beside the outside of this, the eastern apse of um, what was perhaps still a caldarium in the late Roman period. Seeing this plaster, the outermost of several layers of replastering, using opus signine and this, this, this pinkish mortar, mortar made um, pink through the addition of crushed brick, but giving you this, this giving you an idea of how the whole bathhouse would have looked. So these walls, the outer walls, plastered all over, over the vaulted roof uh, structure um, to create this very distinctive white, pinkish white building in the town. So contrasting with the domestic houses and um, other public buildings in the town. And it's remarkable to have this preservation mirrored at the other end um, to, to give us this sense of, of how it might have looked.